This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you all very much for coming and we welcome you to our one day conference on the British reception of, sorry, the reception of Jason Conrad in Europe, the European Society of Jason Conrad. Um, I want to introduce first of all my colleague, uh, Professor Elmer Shackle, who, who is the general editor of this wonderful series, The Reception of British and Irish Authors in Europe, and I hand over to her to say something about the project. Thank you very much. I seem to be leaving rather than coming, but I've got my <laughs> paper here, um, at least I hope I have.
to replace claims to the superiority of culture, especially German culture, um, with an account of reception um, in the reading public, not dictated from above by the great eminence of German literature or um, movement of public taste through successive eras. Uh, the authors who emerged from this inquiry were not dictated from on high nor even necessarily destined for permanent renown. That was not to be the point. The famous poet was no longer a great dichter, representative of German high culture but a mere versifier whose successive generations of readers would judge. I was second guessed at that initial colloquium on that occasion was Professor Bernhard Fabian uh, from the University of Münster, a representative of the new research methods into reception uh, and book history finding out what were the records of public opinion, the identity of readers, the views of readers through different eras, the modes of circulation, the forms of book sales, kinds of borrowing and lending schemes, circulating libraries, reading clubs, availability of books generally, public libraries, spa libraries, um, and in the 19th century, the growth um, of travelers' lending facilities so that businessmen traveling could borrow a book in Paris and return it in Lyon. This mm -hmm. development, if you wish. Bernard Fabian uh, was a great um, contributor to the reconstruction of the lost contents of libraries in Germany both public and private. So much went missing, um, exported. Um, and he brought out 30 odd volumes now tracing the contents of um, libraries in Germany, which no longer exist. Starting with his own university, Gettin. This led um, to a great deal um, from the 18th century um, to the present, really, uh, of new information about English books, among many, many other things. Um, um, whereas previously, um, there had been um, uh, generally thought that, roughly speaking, English books were read in translation in French, in the south of parts of Europe, and in German in the north. Um, but this turns out not to be wholly true. And that there was much more circulation of English books than had been thought of, in fact, in a great deal of what is now been done. So we are dealing with um, a reading public uh, whose knowledge of languages is an important factor of what books are actually available to them. And many books of uh, literary history uh, across Europe are out of date in that way. So there's a great deal of new research. Um, so um, these uh, lifelong researches by theorists, critics, and book historians led to an entirely different approach to criticism. Uh, in many places, not least Britain, however, both terminology and mindset lag behind. For example, uh, as you know, in English, we use the word afterlife for the reputation of an author in subsequent generations. Um, a recent book on the afterlife of Coleridge came out. Um, and by afterlife, I'm shocked, there uh, are ways to find it, uh, only reputation in England, or possibly Britain, um, 
Ireland and sometimes now North America is actually meant by afterlife. Uh, this is, of course, a complete nonsense. Um, and especially struck me in the case of Coleridge, who was himself so concerned with um, the German philosophy. If only, of course, as an indicator of shedding. So, um, this is an accepted critical usage among professionals, yet how limited and how misleading this seems when we uh, look elsewhere for our authors. I should say a word about the arrangements for today uh, rather than lecture and everybody on reception <laughs> studies. Um, we're very sorry to have to say that, of course, Professor Wolfgang is a dying in the first decade of, of this century. Um, but we did manage to do a colloquium in his honor. Uh, these events, uh, which are primarily to bring contributors from different places and languages together to hear the tale told from a different perspective. Normally, uh, we hold only one of these events in preparation for one of our volumes, uh, so we bring um, various uh, national contributors together so that they can meet each other and hear what each other would have to say um, before starting off on their own chapters. Um, but sometimes it's important to change venues and perspectives. Uh, we want to thank Catherine Davis, uh, the director of the IMLR, the uh, Institute of Modern Languages Research, uh, for suggesting that we invite a group of historians in particular, um, um, and this is of course very important for Conrad, um, so uh, we will hold another uh, colloquium in Paris in June, um, and uh, that will fill out the um, contributors to the book in the direction of Italy, Um, and uh, we um, are particularly interested, actually, in uh, Hispanist colleagues, and we have been from the beginning of the project, because we knew that um, uh, there have been few uh, Spanish members of the International Comparative Literature Association uh, over the political events in Spain. So we're very keen to bring uh, Hispanists into the story and we laid stress on including uh, all five Spanish languages in our various books. So if anyone has an interest in, um, uh, in Spanish, they will find a good representation in the series as a whole. And we're particularly glad today to editor from, who is uh, Professor Robert Hansen from the Royal Holloway, who I will in turn introduce, um, and the co-editor Bernie, <coughs> who is here from Versailles, will tell us more of uh, the Paris plans for later. Um, an important element in the colloquium is always an editorial we discuss the policies and practices in these volumes. We've evolved our own house style to deal with material. So the editorial side of today's event is, I'm sorry to say, only for the contributors to the volume. We are being photographed today. And the reason for that is that Daniel Schumann here 
uh, is the recipient of a grant uh, to come here. Um, the, the grant in the body insists uh, on having a photograph uh, or a record of the entire proceedings. So we will all be um, under the scrutiny of the camera. Uh, I, I'm glad to say that, that we've been granted the right to uh, um, strike out either the entire film or parts of it which you consider to be inappropriate for the funding body to receive. <laughs> so the camera is uh, not our doing at all. Um, uh, at least some people would be glad to have their deathless remarks uh, recorded. Um, so, um, no one else um, need to be present, that is, apart from contributors at the editorial meeting, and I'm sure you would find it very boring to hear the vagaries of our diacritical system. So, um, without more ado, I uh, welcome you all here and look forward to the papers and I'll hand over to Mr. Uh, Hampson to uh, introduce the comrade. and also the Casal Endowment Fund, which has also uh, supported today's event. Um, Alan mentioned the afterlife of Conrad. It's currently, a, I sent, was sent an email the other day, part of the afterlife, which is a newspaper, newspaper headline from South Africa, which reads, um, Mr. Blatter, he dead. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so Conrad has extensive reach into unexpected areas. We thought it might be useful if I said a little about the British reception in order to start the nail. So I'll say something very quickly about that and then move on to the French reception. Um, Conrad's work was generally well received by reviewers and fellow novelists from the start of his career. An early review of his first novel, Arnaud's Folly, acclaimed him as a writer of genius. And H.G. Wells in the Saturday Review described now Castellanos, his second novel, as the finest piece of fiction that's been published this year, as Arnaud's Folly was the finest that was published in 1895. The reviewers generally welcomed Conrad's annexation of Borneo, as they someone termed it, while occasionally demurring about his writing style. Even Wells complained about Conrad's haze of sentences, while Max Beerbohm famously parodied Conrad's early style in his 1912 Christmas Garland, <coughs> with a very funny short parody. If these early novels aligned Conrad in the reviewers' eyes, with imperialist writers like Kipling and Stevenson. The novella The Nick of Narcissus, which was also widely reviewed and widely praised, followed later by the novella Typhoon, established him as a writer of the sea, even if of an unusual kind. Zangwill complained of Narcissus that, for example, that it had no plot and no petticoats, uh, which gives some indication of the kind of expectations that people had of sea novels, or complaints also that there were no pirates, no buried treasure, etc., etc. Um, other reviewers linked the novel with naturalism in negative reviews or with impressionism and the impressionism of Stephen Crane in more positive reviews. By the time of Lord Joe Heart of Darkness, Conrad's importance as a novelist was well established among novelists and reviewers, but this hadn't actually translated into large sales. He was seen as a difficult novelist, which obviously he isn't, uh, not just because of his writing style, uh, but also because of his handling of narrative. And his subject matter too, colonialism, seafaring, politics, in Nostromo, the secret agent, and under Western eyes, was seen as unappealing to the female reader <coughs> who constituted the major part of the book by the public. This was to change in 1914 with Chance and the series of novels that followed, Victory, The Arrow of Gold, The Rover, and so on, which had damaged young women at, at their centre. Chance was widely acclaimed in America, even before it was published in Britain. And like all of Conrad's late novels, uh, was a bestseller in the United States. 
It also received generally positive reviews in the UK. The Rescue, which is the final volume in, the, in Conrad's link up trilogy, was praised as a masterpiece in the Glasgow Evening News. It was praised as Conrad's finest work in the London Mercury, although it's been largely unread, I think, for many years. The critical reception of Conrad's work began during Conrad's lifetime. His friend Richard Curl, which is the first full-length study called Joseph Conrad's Study in 1914, uh, which was this was written in consultation with Conrad and presented Conrad as a romantic realist within the European tradition of the novel. Two years later, Conrad's friend Hugh Walpole produced the next British study, uh, the much slighter Joseph Conrad in 1916. Conrad's death in 1923 produced, among other things, John Galsworthy's Reminiscences of Joseph Conrad in 1924, and Ford Malick's Ford's Joseph Conrad, A Personal Remembrance in the same year. And these presented Conrad as the dedicated artist working within a, Euro within a European tradition of the novel. <coughs> in the three decades after Conrad's death, as Owen Knowles has shown, Conrad's reception went through three phases. An initial period of posthumous public acclaim, on the back of those various reminiscences, a period of neglect during the 1930s, and then a dramatic rediscovery of his work during the Second World War and its aftermath. In the period immediately after his death, as the last examples suggest, Conrad's close friends dedicated themselves to fashioning his posthumous legacy through publishing reminiscences, through publishing uncollected works, through the publication of letters. But in his 1930 essay, Conrad and the Younger Generation, Curl had to admit that the younger generation uh, was not actually interested in Conrad. He was, Curl said, too involved in his approach, too sumptuous in his language, and they associated him with the exotic and the picturesque. So by 1934, Walpole could lament that there has been no Conradian influence at all. But as Knowles points out, as Knowles points out it's no accident the revaluation of Conrad's darkly pessimistic fiction and the rediscovery of Conrad as a modern writer coincided with the Second World War. At the same time, another important factor in the revaluation of Conrad was the professionalization of literary criticism, exemplified in Britain, in this instance, by the circle around scrutiny in Cambridge. In 1940, Euro O'Brien published her short study, Joseph Conrad, Poland's English Genius which identified Heart of Darkness as the masterpiece of Conrad's early period and praised Conrad's political vision. The, but the most important work for Conrad's post-World War II rediscovery was undoubtedly F. R. Leavis's The Great Tradition of 1948. Leavis promoted Conrad as the end of a distinguished tradition of the English novel that ran from Austin through Eliot, through the American Henry James, to the Pole Conrad. Similarly, he also constructed a Conrad canon that ran from Typhoon of 1902 to the Shadowline of 1917, and which also interestingly excludes the Marlow works, Youth, Heart of Darkness, and Lord Jim. The rediscovery of Conrad in the post-war period produced and was supported by the publication of the Dentecraft Edition in, from 1947 onwards, which uh, used the text from the earlier Uniform Edition and the same pages. In the 1950s and 60s, Conrad became a central figure in criticism and teaching of 20th century British fiction. Conrad's classic status was also marked by the publication from the late 1950s onwards of his works in the Penguin Modern <coughs> Classic series. By the publication of the first, uh, by the publication of the first scholarly biography, Jocelyn Baines's Joseph Conrad, a critical biography, which came out in 1960. And through the 1960s, by the various scholarly researchers of Norman Sherry and the, the company publications. The British reception of Conrad also becomes increasingly difficult to keep apart from a similar rediscovery taking place in the American Academy, since there was considerable dialogue between the two reception histories. In the US, Albert Gerhard was particularly influential. His Harvard seminar produced two other distinguished Conrad scholars, Thomas C. Moser and Eloise Knapp Hay. Moser, along with Douglas Hewitt in the UK, promoted the influential achievement and decline paradigm <coughs> as a model of Conrad's career. Hay focused on Conrad and politics. While Gerard himself, apart from two influential psychoanalytically oriented monographs on Conrad, wrote the introduction to the edition of Heart of Darkness uh, that Achebe famously responds to without actually naming it. And so it's very much 
the Gerhard's view of Conrad that a JV is attacking. In the 1970s, the Conrad industry really takes off as a British, American, and also international phenomenon. There was the first major international Conrad conference at Kent University in 1973, and the following year, the founding of the Joseph Conrad Society UK. Since then, Conrad's work has ridden the various theory waves that passed through the academy, deconstructionist, post-colonial, feminist, Marxist, new historicist, Lacanian, and has also been a challenge to the achievement of decline paradigm. It's also been institutionalized by two major undertakings, the monumental collected letters of Conrad and the Cambridge edition of the works of Conrad. I'm going to stop this as it then becomes a very much more complicated and much fuller history.